Hello everyone. Um, today we'll discuss shoulder dystocia and it is when one or both shoulders become become impacted against the bones of the pelvis, of the maternal pelvis. So it can happen to the anterior shoulder or it can happen to the posterior shoulder. But most commonly it happens to the anterior shoulder. There are some risk factors for shoulder dystocia um, which can happen antenatally or some of them can happen during labor. Among the risk factors is um, a history of a shoulder dystocia, a large baby, a mother who's got diabetes, um, an obese mother, or a post-term pregnancy. Uh, during labor, you've, you've got uh, the use of forceps or vacuum. Uh, the risk is more pronounced with the forceps, sorry, with the vacuum than the forceps, a uh, prolonged second stage of labor, and induction of labor. Uh, let me mention something on the risk factors, which is these risk factors may be there, may be there, but most of the time you won't get shoulder dystocia. So these risk, risk factors are not predictive of shoulder dystocia. The diagnosis is not very clear. There isn't some standardized criteria on coming up uh, with a diagnosis of shoulder dystocia. However, there may be some parameters that may point you, uh, may, may point you or alarm you of something that may be going wrong. For example, when it, when it, when you apply, when you have to apply more traction when delivering the the trunk eh? because you're applying traction around the neck when you have to apply more traction then probably something is wrong there or the 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 interval between the delivery of the head and the delivery of the body when that interval is more than one minute that could also be a, a red flag to say you could be in trouble the tetra sign the tetra sign is more diagnostic of shoulder dystocia only thing is that it doesn't happen in all babies that suffer shoulder dystocia it happens uh, such that when you have a baby uh, the face has delivered but because the, the shoulders have not delivered it goes back in then again it comes out and retracts comes out and retracts so it's classic it looks like a like a tattoo and that one is more diagnostic of shoulder dystocia than the other criteria only that this one isn't more common in the in the babies that suffer shoulder dystocia there are a few things that we're not supposed to do once we're in the presence of shoulder dystocia for example fundal pressure you see it on our words even in especially in normal deliveries someone has prolonged a bit people apply fund of fund of pressure but it is not supposed to be done even in normal deliveries worse off in shoulder dystocia because you are actually making things worse traction we shouldn't apply too much force when you are going to as you are pulling the neck to try to deliver you should be as gentle as possible especially lateral traction most of the time that you get shoulder shoulder dystocia you know uh, <clears throat> These catastrophic events usually happen when you are alone or you're just the two of you. So you need to have a plan. You need to have a plan as, as, as a doctor as what you are going to do when you're alone or you're just the two of you. Of course, initially you call for help. And the principle that you keep in mind is that you need to deliver. Uh, you need to reduce the time that you are going to deliver the body after the delivery, after the delivery of the head. So you can apply some initial initial gentle traction. Eh? You can also encourage the woman to bear down. Eh? And if you have an assistant, you can tell them to apply suprapubic pressure as you are waiting for help to come. And when help comes, you can start with the macrobats maneuver, which is usually recommended for all cases of shoulder dystocia. In the macrobats maneuver, you need two assistants. Eh? And it will be three, of course, with you. It will be three of you. One will flex the legs out onto the abdomen of the woman. And the other one will do the same thing on the other side. Then you will be applying gentle traction ar around the neck of the baby to try and uh, deliver the shoulder. So 
the traction that you apply as someone is applying suprapubic pressure someone is applying suprapubic pressure there the traction that you apply um the attraction that you apply has to be in the direction of the birth canal yeah? if you apply anteriorly too much or posteriorly too much you are not going to deliver the baby yeah? it's going to be difficult for you mm? so the the McRoberts maneuver has got an advantage in that you know the rotation of the pelvis the rotation of the pelvis towards the head of the mother tends to free the anterior shoulder it doesn't really increase the diameter of the pelvis it just tends to dislodge the shoulder that is impacted there the other maneuver is a woods corkscrew maneuver in this one you put your your hand <clears throat> you put the hand in the posterior aspect you're trying to find the posterior shoulder so when you find the posterior shoulder you rotate it eh, in a corkscrew manner 180 degrees as you are rotating this shoulder coming towards this side you dislodge this shoulder that is usually uh, that is usually impacted in the delivery of the posterior arm you put your hand in the vagina of course and you find the posterior arm eh? you find the posterior arm then you bring it towards the chest you bring it towards the chest then you find the hand you find the hand and you grasp it and pull it out eh? you deliver the posterior arm and of course after the delivery of the posterior arm the anterior shoulder that is impacted is usually dislodged this delivery of the posterior arm is one of the methods that is quite effective in dislodging uh, in dislodging the impacted shoulder the rubin's maneuver is one of is one of the other maneuvers that you can do so you find the shoulder that is easily accessible remember here you have the anterior shoulder and here you have the posterior shoulder and they are aligned eh? they are aligned so this is your hand now here as a doctor this is your hand and you you place it inside you find the anterior shoulder and you push it towards the chest of the baby eh? you push the anterior shoulder towards the chest of the baby that reduces the diameter between the two shoulders it reduces the bisacromial diameter with the effect of uh, delivering the shoulder that is that is impacted now when all those maneuvers are failed when all those maneuvers are failed you can resort to these maneuvers that we have here for example the zavaneri maneuver the zavaneri maneuver uh, means that you put the baby back inside uh, you put the baby back inside and go and do a cesarean section cleidotomy cleidotomy means you fracturing the the clavicle eh? when you when you fracture the clavicle you are likely going to reduce the diameter between the two shoulders but of course you do this when the baby has died eh? the, the cleidotomy symphysiotomy is when you cut um, uh, on the symphysis pubis using a blade hoping that you increase the diameter hoping that you increase the diameter of the pelvic outlet as you can see these maneuvers you you really don't want to to reach this point yeah, they are quite maneuvers that are done in in desperation uh, so to say shoulder distortion has got complications for the mother and for the baby and they can happen to both the mother and the baby at the same time among the complications you have postpartum hemorrhage all forms of uh, perineal tears breakdown of the wound uh, fistulas dyspareunia fecal incontinence to the baby you may get a fracture of the clavicle fracture of the humerus a brachial plexus injury hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy and you know in certain circumstances you may lose you may lose the baby so with all these complications you may want to think of a way to prevent the shoulder distortion but you know 
unfortunately the shoulder dystocia cannot be predicted and if you can't predict it it is very difficult it's very difficult to prevent you may say but okay we have got risk factors such as obese women or large babies shouldn't we do a cesarean section let's say or induce labor prophylactically in those women that we've detected certain risk factors for shoulder dystocia so the current the current advice is that uh, when you suspect that uh, a woman has got a macrosomic baby when you suspect it is not it is not a recommendation uh, for you to go ahead and do an elective cesarean section however when you actually have a baby that is more than 3.5 kg 3.8 kg in a diabetic mother then probably you want to uh, they probably want to recommend or you want to discuss a, a planned cesarean delivery in a woman that is not diabetic and the baby is 4 4 kg 4.1 4.3 on your scan then in that one also you want to have a discussion around the cesarean section um, babies that are born of diabetic mothers are at more risk of getting shoulder dystocia because the distribution of the fat is abnormal in the babies of diabetic mothers the distribution of the fat is actually towards the trunk upwards so towards the trunk and towards the shoulders that's why actually you get the shoulders uh, getting stuck on the on the birth canal so that was the presentation on shoulder dystocia thank you for listening and i hope to see you next